Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, and I feel very privileged to have received the President's Medal at this uh, stage of my career, and I'd just like to thank the SCB for the support they provided. The title of my talk is a, a spatial interactome reveals um, the anatomy of the algal CO2 fixing organelle, also known as the pyranoid. So photosynthesis is central to life on Earth. It harnesses uh, energy from sunlight to fix carbon dioxide into organic carbon. Photosynthetic organisms drive the global carbon cycle, drive the global carbon cycle, produce pretty much all the food we eat and other uh, basis of many of the drugs and fuels we use in modern day society. My research aims to understand the molecular processes that drive global carbon fixation. Uh, we use high throughput and systems biology approaches combined with biochemistry to understand specific gene function and synthetic biology to try and recreate uh, molecular, uh, recreate pathways and s structures in uh, different organisms. We also, use a, a, we also are starting to use a wide range of different organisms in our lab. We use diatoms, uh, green algae, and cyanobacteria. Most of the work I'm going to present today is based on uh, recent work we've done in green algae and understanding uh, an organelle called the pyranoid. Just to give you a brief talk outline, um, first I'll talk about how the algal pyranoid enhances ca carbon fixation. Then I'll um, go into depth on a systematic localization approach we developed to understand the anatomy of the pyranoid. Um, we then use this data to build a protein-protein interactome of the CO2 concentrating mechanism and the pyranoid. Uh, this led us to discover a protein that links Rubisco together to form the pyranoid. And also we went on to um, use some of the lines we generated to show that the pyranoid is a liquid-like organelle that phase separates uh, within, the, within the chloroplast of algae. So at, the center of, uh, at the center of photosynthesis is the enzyme Rubisco. Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide into organic carbon. However, it can be rate limiting for photosynthesis. To overcome this, nearly all algae and many plants have evolved CO2 concentrating mechanisms which make Rubisco run faster. Um, in addition, uh, algae package their rubisco into a substructure called the pyranoid, which, which is highlighted here in blue within the green chloroplast of a Chlamydomonas reinhardtii cell, which is a model organism we use in the lab. What a lot of people aren't aware of is that um, this organelle is fundamental for driving global carbon fixation. Approximately half of global carbon fixation is done by single-celled photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. And if you look at chlorophyll fluorescence, which is a proxy for photosynthesis, photosynthesis we see large amounts of photosynthesis taking place within, within the oceans. Um, excuse me. When we look at what organisms are doing this carbon fixation, we see that um, is, uh, is largely driven by diatoms, coccolithophores, and chlorophytes, all eukaryotic algae. When we look at their um, molecular, um, when we look at more details in their, mo in their morphology, they all contain uh, substructures called pyranoids, which is a, the aggregation of rubisco. This means that through calculations, uh, we've, we think that approximately 30% of global carbon fixation is taking place within pyranoids. However, until recently, our um, understanding of the pyranoid was, was very limited. We had these beautiful uh, electron micrographs showing uh, that we had a, a large aggregation of rubisco and those thylakoid membranes traversing through. However, we knew very little about the molecular components which made up the pyranoid. And so we had some key questions of what proteins make up the pyranoid, what holds the rubisco together in the matrix, and how does the pyranoid divide? So this um, led us to thinking of approaches we could start to answer these questions. And one was to develop a high throughput fluorescent protein tagging 
pipeline. What we did is we took 626 candidate uh, components of the pyrenoid and CO2 uptake uh, and developed a high throughput fluorescent protein tagging approach. We successfully cloned 303 of these components and got high quality uh, imaging data for 146. Just to give, um, just to give you a, sorry, I just wanted to highlight that this is a, a large team effort and there's a large number of Stanford undergraduates who, who helped out on this project. Just to give you a snapshot of the sort of data we were generating, we started to localize protein to pretty much every known organelle in Chlamydomonas. Highlighted in green, uh, YFP tagged fluorescent proteins, and in magenta is the chlorophyll. And just to zoom in and into a couple, this is a, a, a mitochondrial localized protein, which forms these beautiful networks around the chloroplasts of Chlamydomonas. And this is a, a flagella um, localized protein, um, as you can see, clearly localized to the flagella. And we're starting to build some evidence that maybe the flagella is somehow involved in inorganic carbon sensing. But what we were really interested in is proteins which started to localize to the chloroplast, and in particular, to the pyrenoid. We could show that uh, Rubisco and Rubisco activase uh, both localized to the pyrenoid, um, to, which supports uh, the current literature. But we also started to see uh, novel proteins localizing to the pyrenoid matrix, including a, a methyl transferase, and this protein uh, we called EPIC1 for essential pyrenoid component one. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Um, we could also confirm proteins localizing to the periphery and started to see novel uh, peripheral patterns, um, including punctate localization patterns, uh, more continuous localization patterns, um, and also proteins which localize to the, to the phylicoid membranes traversing through the pyrenoid. Um, to try and get a uh, higher uh, spatial detail, we did a detailed uh, confocal uh, microscopy, um, including taking Z, uh, Z, Z stacks through the pyrenoid. And here we're starting at the top of the pyrenoid and going to the bottom. And this is a protein called LCI9. And what we can see as we section through the pyrenoid is that it forms a, a mesh-like structure. Um, and so this is a mesh-like structure forming around the pyrenoid. We could do the same with multiple different lines. Uh, so this is LCIC and the same going from top to bottom. And we see that this is more punctate. Um, we could then generate chlamydomonas uh, lines which were expressing both, both of these proteins tagged with different fluorophores. So we could have LCI9 tagged with a, a YFP venus uh, and LCIC tagged with a, an M cherry, which is an RFP based protein, and see that they don't co localize, but they have uh, distinct localization patterns with the uh, the LCI9 inside of the LCIC. So we could do this with multiple proteins to start to build a, uh, a spatial uh, understanding of how proteins are localized around this organelle. And so what we have is we have a core matrix made up of, of a rubisco, predominantly made up of rubisco. Surrounding this is a plate layer, with, which we think have proteins associated with a starch. Um, and then filling in the gaps between the starch we have a, a mesh type layer. Uh, traversing through the pyrenoid are the, are the phylicoids and we have specific proteins which uh, label, label, these, um, label these membranes. Then surrounding the phylicoid entry sites, we have a puncta LCIB and LCIC, made up of LCIB and LCIC. And then we also have proteins which we think are localized within the phylicoids and become uh, an aggregate at the entry sites. So we now have quite a, a detailed understanding of the spatial distribution of proteins uh, in, the, um, in the pyrenoid, but we thought we could further extend this. So what we decided to do is uh, develop a protein-protein interactome using these proteins as baits. So we took 38 of these tagged lines, uh, each which have a, a YFP tag, but also have a 3X flag tag on, at the C terminal of the YFP. We could then do affinity purification uh, followed by mass spectrometry to identify the interacting proteins 
of, of these, of these tagged lines. I just want to highlight uh, uh, an undergrad then a technician in the lab called Chris Chen uh, had, a, had a really important role in this. And so we could take all this protein-protein interaction data and generate protein-protein interactome maps of the CO2 uptake mechanism and the pyrenoid. Um, and what's shown here is each dot represents a, a protein uh, and each uh, line represents a, a, a interaction. And we could take these interaction maps and then also combine our localization data to start to build spatially defined protein-protein interactomes. Uh, and this is the interactome we, we generated. Um, and so what we have here is, is a pyrenoid uh, and then different uh, membrane layers and then the external environment. And each protein is represented by a dot still and interaction by, uh, by lines. And um, we could, we're now starting to take this data and systematically characterize all these different interactors. Um, and we're starting to find really novel insights into CO2 fixations. Just to highlight one, um, for a long time, there was a missing step in inorganic carbon transport from the external environment into the pyrenoid. And through the, our interaction data, we now have three uh, potential bicarbonate transporters, which we're characterizing in detail, uh, filling in this missing step of this process. Um, as I... Um, as I mentioned earlier on, one of our interests was how could Rubisco, how is Rubisco aggregated to form the pyrenoid or assembled to form the pyrenoid? Uh, and from our localization data, um, we identified a protein which is uh, abundant within the, uh, within the pyrenoid. And, we, um, and as I mentioned, we termed this EPIC-1. We, we could generate uh, dual tag lines so expressing uh, YFP EPIC-1 and M. cherry uh, rubisco and show that they co-localize and always stay co-localized. Then through uh, some uh, pyrenoid proteomics data, we could, um, from using isolated pyrenoids, we saw that uh, EPIC-1 um, is highly abundant uh, and is also uh, with considerable abundance to rub the rubisco large and small subunit. Um, it also becomes enriched at low CO2 when the pyrenoid grows in size. Uh, supporting um, th this, just supporting that it's a highly abundant pyrenoid protein. Then um, we generated an EPIC-1 mutant, knockout mutant, um, which with, with, a random, with an insertion uh, into the genomic location, and uh, the mutant... Uh, um, failed to express the EPIC-1 protein shown here uh, where we see EPIC-1 protein in wild type but it's absent in the mutant. Um, this mutant we could also characterize its phenotype and show that it's essential for CO2 uh, uptake um, where the mutant grows like wild type cells at high CO2 where you, when you don't need a pyrenoid or a CO2 concentrated mechanism but when you put the, uh, the mutant onto low CO2 where uh, it's essential to have a pyrenoid, um, it fails to grow. And we can rescue this phenotype by inserting a wild-type copy of the gene. Um, knowing that it's in the, in the pyrenoid um, and has a, as in, has a key CCM, CO2 uptake uh, phenotype, we wanted to have a look at any changes in pyrenoid morphology. And we did TEM imaging to quantify a pyrenoid size. And visually, you can see that the EPIC-1 mutant has a, a diminished pyrenoid. Also, by looking at hundreds of images, we can quantify this. Uh, and again, we clearly see that the EPIC-1 mutant has a severely reduced pyrenoid size. Uh, to gain a, det a, more detailed, um, a more detailed picture of what the pyrenoid looked like in the mutant, we did quick freeze depetched electron microscopy. And in wild type, here is a pyrenoid and if you zoom in you see this dense packing of proteins whereas in the mutant uh, it's a lot less densely packed. So we had two ideas that um, in the EPIC-1 mutant it just fails to express Rubisco and therefore you have a um, uh, you don't have Rubisco packaging into the pyrenoid and you have a diminished pyrenoid or 
um, it just fails to aggregate Rubrisco into the pyrenoids. So to test this, uh, we did a Western blotting against Rubisco, and we see that Rubisco levels are comparable between the wild type and the mutant. Um, so we thought it might be a localization issue. Um, so we went on to look at this by two approaches. One was to put in fluorescently tagged Rubisco into the wild, into wild type and the mutant line. And the second approach was to do immunogold uh, labeling. And in both cases, we see that the mutant fails to put Rubisco into the pyrenoid. So this is the amount of Rubisco outside of the pyrenoid. So it's failing to package Rubisco. Uh, so we knew that they were both, we knew that uh, Epic one was in the, in the pyrenoid and essential for pyrenoid uh, structure. And so we wanted to test if they were in a complex. So to do this, uh, we did a co-amino precipitation. Um, so we used three different baits. We used the control, so this is just a YFP with a 3X flag, and we pulled down using the 3X flag, and then we looked for the presence of Rubisco and the presence of Epic one And we see that in the control, it's in the input, and it, the Rubis Rubisco and Epic one are in the input, but they aren't eluted. Yet when we pull down with the Epic one tagline, we see Rubisco uh, in the elution, and we also see Epic one in the elution. And then doing the reciprocal experiment with tagged Rubisco, Again, we see Rubisco and we also see Epic one indicating that they're at least in the same complex together. Then looking a bit more into the uh, structure of Epic one we see that it's um, a highly disordered uh, repeat protein made up of four nearly identical 60 amino acid repeats. And so um, we currently think that Epic one is linking Rubisco together to form the pyrenoid, and I'll share a little bit more data on this uh, at the end of my talk. So uh, the final um, story I want to talk about is how the pyrenoid behaves as a, a liquid-like organelle. So it's, it's non-membrane bound, and, it's, and we think it's uh, behaving as a liquid-liquid phase-separated organelle within the chloroplast. Um, at the start of my paystock around six years ago, there was, some, um, there was some literature that the pyrenoid might actually be a crystalline or even an amorphous solid structure. And so looking at some old EM images, you could see a, a, like crystalline lattices. Yet this posed two, uh, two questions. One was, how could Rubisco be reactivated? So every so often, Rubisco misfires and ends up in a, in a confirmation where it's inactive. And uh, this um, chaperone, Rubisco activase, has to come in and reactivate it. But Rubisco activase is at a lot lower concentration than Rubisco. Uh, so we wondered how this could happen in a, in a more solid um, structure. Also, um, how could, the, how could a, a solid like crystalline or amorphous solid structure divide uh, during cell division? And we had uh, just one EM image taken in 1970 showing this like extension of the pyrenoid during division. And, and this really to us didn't look like a, a solid structure. So what we could do is we could take a fluorescently, a fluorescently tagged Rubisco, which is found within the pyrenoid, so this is just the pyrenoid we're looking at here, and do a FRAP experiment, so fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching, and look how uh, un, uh, unbleached Rubisco moved throughout the pyrenoid. And to sh just to uh, show you what's happening, we're taking our pyrenoid, we're photo bleaching half it, so uh, in theory just switching off, in principle switching off the, the YFP fluorophore, and then we're looking what happens to the unphoto bleached half. And what we see is that it rapidly fills back in and becomes homogeneous within about 30 seconds. Uh, Yet yeah, if we do this with a former aldehyde fixed control, there's no recovery, as you can see here, relative up here when you photo bleach and then it rapidly recovers. So we knew, so we've now found that the Rubisco is rapidly moving around in the pyrenoid and we could show this for other pyrenoid components that everything is moving, uh, everything is continually mixing in the pyrenoid. Next we thought we could start to get an idea into how the pyrenoid divides and it actually divides by fission. So um, this is a, this time we have chlorophyll shown in magenta and uh, YFP uh, Rubisco YFP, and 
he gave for cell division and the, the pyrenoid actually elongates like a, imagine like a water droplet if you're trying to split it in two, it elongate and then pinch off. And just showing you in a different cell, which really clearly shows this, you can see this elongation step, a pinching, and then just the formation of two new daughter pyrenoids. I just want to highlight that uh, a PhD student at Stanford, Elizabeth Freeman Rosenberg, uh, did a lot of this imaging, uh, and she's a really great uh, student. Um, and finally, what we saw, which we were really excited about during this division step, is that the pyrenoid actually dissolves and recondenses, or partially dissolves and recondenses. So what we're seeing is you see a pyrenoid, and just prior to division, there's a sudden burst in signal throughout the stroma of the toroplast. And then after division, it suddenly recondenses. And you can see quite clearly here in these dis, uh, different time points, this uh, dis, dissolution and then recondensation. Um, so uh, we're, we're really, um, we think this is um, a really interesting phenomenon and um, which we're trying to understand in more detail. And uh, what we think is the potential basis of this is that um, you could rapidly modify the number of binding sites present uh, in the EPIC1 protein. Um, so what we have is uh, EPIC1 protein, which has four, four repeats, uh, and then a Rubisco holo enzyme, which is made up of eight large and eight small subunits. So it has potentially eight binding sites. And uh, with collaborators in Princeton who did um, off-lapis 3D modeling, uh, they showed that if you regulate the number of binding sites, uh, you can regulate the, the condensation and dissolution of the pyrenoid. So if there's three available binding sites, you will get aggregation. And the same if you get five, if there's five available binding sites. Uh, we also now have data that there is a potentially a fifth binding site at this C terminus, the point is. Yet if you have four binding sites, you get dissolution. And the idea is that if you have something with eight binding sites and four binding sites, uh, it can, um, uh, so Rubisco can become saturated with EPIC uh, and there's no available binding sites. But if you, in a three or five available binding site configuration, there'll always be available binding sites which can then link between Rubisco molecules. And, it, and it's, we thought this was very interesting because it's not merely a number of, increase the number of binding sites, you have more aggregation there's actually this, these magic numbers, and we can extend this in both, uh, well, even more, num even more binding sites, and you still have these magic number effects. Um, and so we think this potential dissolution uh, and recondensation is really important um, for a couple of reasons. One is that during cell division, you don't always get perfect, um, you don't always get a perfect division of the pyrenoid, so each daughter cell doesn't necessarily receive a single pyrenoid. Sometimes a pyrenoid will go to one, just only one daughter cell. Yet if you've dissolved partially your, your rubisco, the daughter cell which doesn't receive the pyrenoid still has rubisco, which can then recondense to form a new pyrenoid. And we have data su supporting this. Uh, also, um, we think that having a pyrenoid uh, is probably is really key that you can rapidly assemble it and disassemble it if you're in a heterogeneous environment where there's different levels of CO2. So in high CO2, you, you might be more favorable not to have a pyrenoid and have your rubisco floating around, but as soon as you go into a low CO2 environment, you really need your pyrenoid for a fully functional CO2 uptake mechanism. So you can quickly regulate this by a post-translational modification of your linker. So just to summarize uh, what I've told you, um, Pyrenoid-containing algae are really fundamental for global carbon fixation, uh, and we think they're in the, they fix in the region of approximately 30% of the global uh, of global CO2 fixed by organic uh, fixed by um, uh, fixed by photosynthetic organisms. Um, we developed a, a systematic fluorescent protein tagging pipeline to discover new pyrenoid components. We combined uh, affinity purification and mass spectrometry data. Uh, to generate a spatial, spatially defined protein-protein interactome of the pyrenoid and the CO2 concentrator mechanism. We discovered a linker protein which holds rubisco together to form the pyrenoid. Um, and finally, um, I showed you that the pyrenoid behaves like a, a liquid-like non-membrane-bound organelle which can rapidly phase separate from its surrounding media.
So I'd just like to, to thank uh, different people involved in this work. Uh, so Chris Chen and Elizabeth Freeman, who are both at uh, Stanford and the Carnegie Institution for Science, uh, to be a Mettler and Moritz Mayer. Um, and it was a really large team, team effort, and um, I really appreciate everybody's input and the support I've had. Also, I'd like to acknowledge all my supervisors I've had during, during my career so far. So my PhD supervisors, uh, Professor Ulf Riebersell, Professor Colin Brownlee, uh, and Dr. Glenn Wheeler. I'd really, uh, really like to thank um, my postdoc supervisor, uh, Martin Jonikus, who's now at Princeton University. And he's a real, he was a real inspiration for me and gave me a lot of academic freedom to really follow uh, my, my interests and do what I wanted, wanted to do in the, in the lab. I really appreciate that. He's also a great, great mentor. Uh, and then all the support I've had since I started at York, uh, in particular, Professor Ian Graham has been really supportive whilst I've set up my lab at York. And then just finally, I'd like to thank uh, all my lab members. Uh, we've got a team of seven currently, uh, and we have BBSRC uh, funding and Labour Hume Trust funding. Also, uh, University of York priming. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank the SCB for the, this conference and awarding me the, the President's Medal. Thank you very much. <laughs>